Hey everyone, welcome to Curtain Call. I'm Kevin Curtin. I'm here today with a very special guest right here in Philadelphia. Now, this man sitting right next to me is the voice and original lead singer of the iconic group, The Stylistics. And he's also one of the greatest singers in music history. It's truly an honor to be here with him today. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to the legendary Russell Tompkins Jr. Russell, uh, thank you for being on the show. I really uh, appreciate thank, your time today. Thank you very much, Kevin. Yeah, you're, you're uh, it's my welcome. pleasure. Thank you very much. So, so let's get right into this. You know, can you take me back to growing up in Philly? What it was like, you know, as a young man. Um, you know, maybe what it was like around the house, and when you finally found your voice. If you can kind of take me through that. Um, well, music was always in my house. Uh, my father was a singer, mm -hmm. so uh, I knew very early that I had the ability to sing. And the teachers in school found out about it also. Uh, I sang in the glee club and elementary school. I sang in the glee club and the chorus in junior high school and the city's choir during that time. But uh, on the street, we were singing on the corner, singing all the more popular songs that were coming out in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, maybe if you can take me through, you know, some of the groups uh, that maybe you were listening to and also some of the early influences that maybe shaped your future sound, uh, the falsetto and, and... Well, very early, Mm. I was listening to the music that my parents listened to, so I was mm -hmm. listening to uh, Sarah Vaughn, Donna Washington, uh, Billy Eckstein, Johnny Hartman, um, all the singers from that era, mm -hmm. you know, from the 40s and 50s. And I did that all the way up until my late, I guess, before I went into my teens. I started listening to a station here called uh, WIBG, mm. and I listened to Frankie Valli. Nice. And when I heard Frankie Valli sing, mm -hmm. that's the first time I knew that I could sing the falsetto because I was a natural tenor at mm -hmm. that time being uh, of my age. Sure. But I knew I could sing the falsetto like uh, Frankie Valli did. And from then, Motown came in. Mm -hmm. Temptations. Yes. Eddie Kendricks. I yeah. heard Eddie Kendricks and uh, Smokey Robinson. Mm. And so I started singing their songs. But my my learning experience came from listening to i joined the the columbia record club mm. and when you join the columbia record club they give you a turntable and you get free records yeah and my first three records were uh dion Wart, frank sinatra and morgana king wow Jeez. and i played them until the grooves were gone mm -hmm. trying to learn you know the things that they did and mm -hmm. they were my my influences to when I became a, a, you know, a professional singer. Sure. You know, I, I just want to know, I had the great honor to meet Dion a couple months back. Uh, mm -hmm. She just released a new album. And, yes, uh, I have it. Yeah. And I had, a, uh, had the honor to meet her, and there was a, a party with Clive Davis, and uh, what an honor, you know, and, and Dion is just one of, the, one of the greatest of all time. That's my favorite singer. Favorite singer. Yes. Yeah. Do you have a favorite Dion song, by the way? No, I love them all. You love them all. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's hard and to pick one. Um, I, I sang them all. Uh, yeah. I still do almost every day. Wow. And uh, I never make a, a record now without mm -hmm. doing something that Bert does. You know, yeah. I've worked yeah. with him also. So right. Uh, right. I love all the, all the music that Bert has made. Yeah, and I want to definitely uh, get back to that uh, later on in the conversation because mm -hmm. I do want to, you know, uh, hear from you on what it was like working with Bert. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, moving forward here, um, you know, I understand, too, at a young age, I think it was around nine years old, but correct me if I'm wrong, you had met Teddy Pendergrass as a young man. Uh, yes. Uh, I lived in, in, I grew up in North Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and uh, I lived on a street at uh, called Garnett Street between 19th and 20th, mm -hmm. Jefferson and Oxford. Mm -hmm. And uh, across the street from me was a family uh, called the Weeklies, and mm -hmm. Teddy Pendergrass was uh, related to them. Mm. And he would come and see them, and whenever he came around, you know, I, I met him then. Yeah. And then we would see each other over the years. Uh, mm -hmm. My wife also went to school with him. Mm. Yeah. So early on those interactions, uh, was it more kind of playing basketball, doing sports, or were you guys talking about being singers in the future and, and stuff like that? No, we really didn't talk about anything like that. Mm. Um, I never had extensive conversations with him until we both became professionals. Mm -hmm. You know, when he was with Harold Melvin's Blue Notes, right. you know, uh, I met him then again when mm -hmm. we were grown. And so by then we both had recordings, so mm -hmm. we, would, we would work together. We would tour together and see yeah. each other, transportation, yeah. riding on buses, planes, and you know, yeah. we would talk mm -hmm. then. 
I'm sure it was interesting too to kind of you know as the years went on to kind of go back and forth between the hits. Maybe he would tell you what he liked, and maybe you would tell him what you like. Maybe, maybe not. But mm. Mm, no, most so of the much, yeah, yeah, most of the time we would see each other at social events. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, we all were you know big 76er fans. So yeah. after the basketball game, we would go down to a club that was in the spectrum called Ovations, and mm -hmm. I and I would see him down there with his people, and me and my wife would go downstairs, and he'd come over to the table, sit down, and talk with us for a while. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because he just we knew each other as as children. You know, before. Mm. The music got in there, and that's how we were with each other. Yeah, not, and not about talking business or right. music, but just friendship. Just regular, yeah, yeah. regular stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So you know, can you kind of take me and and also too, um, if you can, there was a theater called the Uptown Theater. Um, is that theater still in existence, or it's no longer? It no longer gives shows, but the theater is still there because it's a landmark, mm -hmm. and. Uh, all the great shows came to the Uptown Theater. I mean, yeah. all the R&B, the greatest R&B shows from uh, Motown Reviews uh, to the uh, the Dells, the Chicago Reviews and everything. And see, I was born about a block from there. Mm -hmm. I, I lived at Carlisle and Diamond and uh, the Uptown is a block and a half away from there. Yeah. And I also worked on Susquehanna Avenue, which is where the uh, Susquehanna and Broad is where the uptown is mm. so i worked in a clothing store and my first manager mm -hmm. in 1968 everyone who worked the uptown theater if you needed if you needed socks or you yeah. needed something to wear mm -hmm. on stage or whatever they all would come around yeah. uh to the store and the store was called swickles tailors mm -hmm. so uh while i'm working there she knew all the entertainers also mm. so i re i was I was 16, 17 years old, and I used to sing while I was working. Mm -hmm. And uh, Miss Wickler used to come walking next to me. She said, "You know, you sound just like a smoke at the Robinson." <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. So, some of the shows that you maybe saw at the Uptown Theater. What what were some of the highlights for you as a oh, young man? I saw, oh, Dion Warwick. Wow. I think uh, the Temptations. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Unifics, the Manhattans with the white gloves. Uh, uh, oh, wow, there were so many great artists would come past, come there. Yeah. And you have to remember at that time, mm -hmm. I had no knowledge, well, before mm -hmm. the time I just mentioned, you know, with yeah. Smokey Robinson, but the show would always happen during school time. Mm -hmm. so, and they had a 50 cent show. So mm -hmm. when we would get out of junior high school, we would go to the Uptown Theater and, and go see the 50 Cent Show. And at that time, mm. I had no idea that I was going to be a singer. Mm, so I was just going there looking to be entertained. Yeah. And I would see everyone there and to listen to the music. They had a big band there. And it had, had such a great effect on me, but I didn't know that I would one day be on that stage. Mm. Do you remember the first time you performed there professionally? Yes. I had to remember very well because I got sick. You did? Yeah. I worked a couple of days and got sick and couldn't work the rest of the show. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. And then the next time I came back, it was a little different. Wow. All right. So we'll get into some of the shows later on here. Um, but can you take me back um, to maybe middle school or high school? I can't remember, but you can correct me on this. The Monarchs and the Percussions, right? Um, those were the two groups. That, yes. Uh, was this in high school, by the way? Uh, yes. Okay. So you were in the Monarchs, right? Yes. And eventually those two groups came together to form the Stylistics, right? Yes. What we know today as the Stylistics. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of take me back to those early days of working with the two different groups, the friendships, kind of the conversations that were had, and then kind of bring us up to speed uh, uh, from that point to when finally things started getting going? Yeah, I didn't... I think that was around... It had to be 65 or 66. Mm-hmm. And me and one of the members in the group, Aaron Love, were very close friends because mm -hmm. in junior high school, we sang in the Glee Club together. Yeah. And so we would do shows. We went to a junior high school that, that gave all type of musical shows. Mm -hmm. So he would sing sometimes with someone else, and I would do a, sh a song on a, some of the shows we would do in the Glee Club. So we became friends from seeing each other and working with each other that way. Mm -hmm. And he was originally in the group called the, the Monarchs. Mm. And uh, it was a guy in the group. His name was Jerry Gross. And me and Jerry, we used to play basketball together. But 
Aaron and Jerry was a year ahead of me in school. So mm -hmm. when when the Monarchs lost Jerry Gross because mm -hmm. he went on to uh, higher education, they they needed a member in the group. Mm -hmm. And Aaron Love came and asked me would I come and sing with them in the Monarchs. Yeah. So that's how I started singing with them. I had no idea that I would be singing in a singing group. Uh, at that time, all I I was I had a, a great basketball Jones. I've always had one my whole yeah. life. So. That's all I was doing, you know, yep. going to school, playing basketball. And I went to a high school that didn't have music. Mm. In junior high school, music and sports, you know, surrounded my whole life. Mm -hmm. And my mother had the idea that she didn't want me to go to regular public school. So she sent me to a farm school that's here in Philly called the Wissahickon Farm School. Now it's called the Walter Biddle Saw. Mm. Uh, school of Agriculture and Horticulture. Mm -hmm. And my mother sent me there. They had no music wow. and they had no sports. Really? None. So wow. I had to make my own when I was there. So yeah. uh, I started the first intramural basketball team there. Mm -hmm. And I took the Monarchs as mm -hmm. a group up there to do a show. Mm -hmm. And we ended up being the band at my prom. Mm -hmm. So... Can you take me back, um, because obviously, you know, the, the two groups eventually form, you get the stylistics, but can you take me back to, obviously, your Big Girl now was the first big hit, right? The first regional hit, and then it became more national, right? So can you kind of take me back to when all that came about, when the recording contract came about, when recording that song maybe came about? Well, after we finished winning the... Um the talent show at Benjamin Franklin High School, mm -hmm. that's when an English teacher in Benjamin Franklin High School had the idea of taking the remainder of both groups, the mm -hmm. percussions and the monarchs, and putting them together to make the stylistics. Mm -hmm. So at that time, uh, we, start, we, had a, we started with a band, and we rehearsed and learned songs. We were singing other people's songs at mm -hmm. that time. And... Uh, my mother and Aaron's mother, they all knew uh, a guy who owned restaurants and, uh, and clubs here in Philly. Mm. In fact, his sons own some of the biggest ones in Philadelphia right now. Oh, wow. Interesting. And uh, he gave us an audition at his nightclub. Mm -hmm. And we went to his nightclub and we started playing there almost every weekend. And, yeah. we, and the reputation of the group started getting around. Yeah. And we started working other engagements at other clubs also. So the mm -hmm. groups reputation was growing strong here in Philly yeah cabarets and at that time it was all it was you know un, unlike discos there were you know re live clubs sure where, where you could work in Philly many mm -hmm. many of them so you could work every weekend mm -hmm. and then uh, somebody had the idea that they wanted us to go into the studio and record a record mm -hmm. and we went into uh, Frank Virtue studio here in Philadelphia and, and we did your big girl now not knowing anything would come from it or you know what the outcome would be sure and uh we all had got jobs yeah uh we went to school Aaron went to school her morell mm -hmm. uh james dunn james smith so we all you know at that time not knowing if we were going to be in the music business you all, got jobs we got jobs yep and, so what uh, were you doing uh, I get that that very last yeah, that job man. I got was w working as a forklift driver at YMY Popcorn Company. Wow. And it was a very good job. Mm -hmm. And Arian had graduated from uh, Dobbins and he had a degree in uh, computer technology. He had got a good job at uh, Cohen's uh, doing computer work. Wow. Uh, Herb Morell, he had got various different jobs. Mm -hmm. And uh, James Dunn still worked at the, the clothing store that we originally... Wow. Uh, wow. interesting. Yeah, we originally... Mm -hmm. uh, I, that I said I had worked that summer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the manager that we had then that worked also with the manager we had at Benjamin Franklin High School, uh, Henry Hodge, mm -hmm. owned the, the clothing store at that time now. Mm -hmm. So he came to us and said, I have an engagement for you mm -hmm. in Newport, Rhode Island for two weeks. Mm -hmm. Two weeks. That means we have to quit our job. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a big change of life, you know, because yeah. we had just started to settle in to uh, being adults. Right. 
and uh, we had to make up our minds. Yeah. And we chose to quit our jobs. Yeah. And, go and do the New engagement. And do the engagement. Yeah. But while we were in Newport, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. our families would come up and see us. And mm -hmm. my, my wife came up mm -hmm. and uh, she said, you know, y'all got a hit record at home. They're playing it on the radio all day long, every day. Wow. And when we got home, that's when uh, your big girl now came Jeez. out. And what it did was enhance the work that we were doing mm -hmm. in Philly. Mm -hmm. And big girl now, it stretched out to New Jersey, right. Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and New York City, you know, in the tri-state area. Yeah. And it started to become a big record there. And the group just started going out further and yeah. further and further. That was the beginning. Do you remember hearing it on the radio for the first time? You hearing it for yes. the first time? Can uh, you take me back to that moment? I, I, it's, it's surprising. And <laughs> yeah. I didn't like it. Really? No, I didn't. Wow. I, I you know, and, and I've never been really, really crazy about this song. Yeah. Yeah. I think I like it more now than I did back, back then. then. Yeah. Because I think I know how to sing it now. Mm hmm. Back gotcha. then, I was just singing it, you know, and uh, not realizing what the, the, the exact meaning of the song yeah. is mm -hmm. and just singing, mm -hmm. you know. And over the years, you know, growing up and being more professional, I know how to sing it now, even though I don't sing it as well as I did then. Well, I wouldn't say that, but, <laughs> but I know you probably are critical of your, of your own. I'm you talking know. about 50 years almost, right, you sure, know, so. Sure. And, but I can get it across now because I know the song mm -hmm. and I like it a little bit better now. Mm. So can you can you kind of, you know, talk about when that song hits and then when Tom Bell comes into the picture, whether he hears that song or whether uh, kind of if you can take us through that moment of when he slides into the arrangement and things, you know. Yeah, I don't think he was too crazy about the song either. He was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, the Tommy Bell thing came yeah. and see, I knew nothing about Tommy Bell. Mm -hmm. Growing up, listening to music on the radio and learning songs, mm -hmm. I didn't bother to know, you know to know what the record company was, the who credits, the, yeah. who the producer was, mm -hmm. who wrote the song. All I listened to was the song, and I knew who sang it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had got we had we were with a local record company called Sebring Records when your big girl now came mm -hmm. out, and the people from C, uh, Sebring and my management at the time got us a deal with uh, Afco Embassy Records. Mm -hmm. And when we worked with Afco Embassy Rec Records, we also worked with the legendary Hugo Lu Hugo and Luigi, mm -hmm. you know, the writers. Yes, uh, and. One day I went up there to talk to them and they said, I want you to be down at the Schubert building on Monday to meet this guy named Tom Bell, mm -hmm. who's going to produce your, your next album. Unbelievable. So yeah. I went down there and I met him that, mm -hmm. that morning and we sat down at the piano and he played some songs yeah. and I started singing them and uh, I knew something special was about the music, you know, mm -hmm. but at that time I'm still in this, you know, young age and, mm -hmm. and not knowing a lot of things that were going on and just working off of sheer, you know, sheer uh, ability. Yeah. What was your first impression meeting Tom? And, and what, what, what was he like? What is he like? We don't really know a lot about Tom other than uh, the music. You know? He was a, uh, he was real, you know, he was really great. You know, I, 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 I at that time I had always wanted mm. to be a piano player, but I, I never, you know, had ventured to try to do it. Yeah. And I would sit down with him and he was playing piano and I was, you know, astounded by listening to his piano playing. Mm -hmm. And then he sang. Yeah. Everything, he sang everything the way I would sing it. Wow, interesting. And all I had to do was repeat the mm -hmm. things that he was showing me musically. Mm. And I later on I knew that what he was giving me was grooming me and giving me a style, mm -hmm. you know, before I sang whatever the song was, if it was high, if it was mm -hmm. low, if it was this, if it yeah. was that, you know, uh, also with the, with the same type of mentality I had earlier, I told you not even realizing mm -hmm. the, 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 the real meaning of the song, you know, like my favorite song, Betcha by Golly Wow, you know, mm. I, I didn't, as the years went on, it became, 
something that I really felt. Yeah. And that's another thing that happened when I worked with Tommy and with Linda Creed. With Linda Creed. Yeah, because yeah. Linda was writing the songs. Yeah. That everything that was in these songs, mm. and it's, you know, that's how God works, mm -hmm. was happening to me in yeah. my life at the really? same time. Yes. Wow. Interesting. And that gave me an understanding of what the songs were about. you could really sing it. Yes. Like you said before, yeah. you can really sing it. And, it, and yeah. you know, that gave me a better understanding mm -hmm. of what the songs were. Mm -hmm. And working with Tommy and Linda, as I said, he was giving me a sound. Mm -hmm. So it was a learning process. Yeah. You know, every song, every album, I would get better and better at what I had to do, you know. It was kind of rough at the time, too, because uh, the stylistics were always a working group. Right. Because we started out working nightclubs and things yeah. like that. So I would be traveling. We started to work more and more, travel all over the world. We started working with James Brown because the company that put, took us as an agency yeah. um, was also the management with James Brown. So they sure. would hook us up with James and we would travel all over all over the country. What was that like by the way? Oh, that was that was a another learning experience. I think it was I got married in what 19 what was it, 1970 I think and mm -hmm. uh, just a few days after me and my wife got married, we went yeah. on like a 35 uh, one night tour with with James wow. Brown, you know. And so James would at that time there was no video. Yeah. So no one could you know they would hear your records on the, on the radio but mm -hmm. no one would know who you were and how sure. you looked yeah except for maybe on the album cover right and uh, working with james is what gave us an audience mm -hmm. people knew who we were after that and how we looked and uh, the fan base started to grow mm -hmm. you know so uh so he really put you on the map yes in he terms did of, wow yes he did i mean very much so mm -hmm. uh we had a good time working with them too. Uh, that's what we went on yeah. the road the same time. The dramatics were with oh, us. Oh, okay. Love and, the dramatics. Yeah, yeah. Me and Ron Banks became very close friends. We were very close friends for life until he passed away. Yeah. And um, uh, man, we would break all of James' rules. We yeah. do what we want to do. We were late all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was, yeah. We drove him. Crazy. He was strict, right? Yeah. yeah. We drove him oh, crazy. Yeah. yeah. Now, did he ever come up to you and say, man, I love what you're doing or I love your voice? Did he ever compliment you? Oh, yes. Yes. Well, James is tough. James yeah. don't like nobody to be better than him. Yeah. And, is, and nobody is better than him. Right. You know, so mm -hmm. I would do certain things to, to enhance my show mm -hmm. when, the, you know, because I would open for him. But I yeah. also sing background for him, all, too. Interesting. So I'm opening for James Brown and I go on stage and I want to be better. I want to be better. Mm -hmm. So I start doing things like jumping off the stage and <laughs> going up and down the aisle singing with no microphone and, yeah. and James be like on stage, what is he doing? <laughs> what are you doing out here? Get him back on that stage. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's stage. funny. Then that's after funny. the show, he would yeah. call me into his dressing room and he'd sit down and he say, you know, Russell, mm -hmm. you know, I really like you. You did a, you did a great job, wow. nice show and whatever, you know, and if you ever have any problems or you're tired or whatever, you know, just come see me. I can straighten out everything for you. And and once in a while, we, we would have these conversation, <laughs> conversations. Yeah. And I think at the time, I had an afro. Mm -hmm. So my afro was there and I was fine, but I cut my afro off. Yeah. And one time we were working in California. He said, come here, Russell, sit down yeah. here. He said, look, let me tell you something. If you want to be a star, you got to have some hair. Yeah. He said, look at me. See, see how heavy you had, you know, had the process sure. here. Yeah. And yeah. I'm just sitting at him, sitting there smiling. Yeah. Knowing I'm not going to do anything that he's telling me to do, mm -hmm. but I'm smiling. Yes, sir, Mr. Brown. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah. So, you know, getting back to, and, and by the way, James Brown, I mean, you wouldn't have Michael. You wouldn't have Prince without James Brown. You would have Those, us. Exactly. So, you know, James is definitely one of the greats. And, yes. uh, you know, his influence is, is still today, you know, one of the one of the best, you know, forever, uh, forever. Yeah, absolutely. So can, going back to Tom Bell, there's another individual there you mentioned before, Linda Creed. I don't know much about her other than knowing what she contributed to the to the records. She obviously passed away years ago. What was she like as a person, as a songwriter? What What were your interactions with her? Well, that morning when I went to uh, the Schubert building to see mm -hmm. Tom Bell, I met her again. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when I walked through the door, I said, I know her. You know, she's a beautiful girl. Mm. And you wouldn't forget her if mm. you ever met Interesting. her. Interesting. 
and uh, I walked through the door. I remember you. We had done a show about a year uh, before that, maybe more, mm -hmm. at a place here in Philadelphia uh, called uh, something ballroom at 54th and Arlington. It, it might come to me. I'm having one of them senior moments now. Take your time. Take your time. <laughs> and yeah. uh, the, the something ballroom. Mm -hmm. and, and she was a singer. Interesting. And she was on the show with us that night. And so mm -hmm. when I went up there, I met her then. And um, I wouldn't see her much. Her, her office was right next to Tommy. So while mm -hmm. I was in the room working with Tommy and working on songs, she would come over and give him lyrics. And he would play them and he would sing. No, it's not quite quite there yet. Give it back to her. She'd go over to the room. Wow. Half an hour or so, she'd come back. He'd play it. Yeah. It was right on time. Interesting. And so, it, you know, they were knocking out them songs like that. And I'm just sitting there. He'd yeah. play. he say, sing it like this and yeah. go from here. And I remember when she would come back with the songs, they, mm -hmm. would, they would be perfect. They wow. would be right on time. So a lot of the time you would be in the studio or be with them while they, either before they were working on the songs, you wouldn't come in and the song would be done. You, a lot some, of it, sometimes. Some, some. Yeah, some would yeah. be already done and some were in the process of being, uh, being written at, mm. at that time. What about the, when the musicians came in and recorded all their parts? Um, were, were you there for that or no? When I finished doing my work with Tommy, yeah. Uh, the initial work of yep. sitting down and learning the songs and uh, knowing what they were about, I would leave and I'd go back on the road. You would? Yeah, sometimes I would just fly in to Philly yeah. and do the recordings and fly back out and go back on the road wow. again. Because uh, I don't know if you know this or not, mm -hmm. but the, the rest of the stylistics never sang on the first I do know that, yeah. yeah so. And I wanted you to tell our audience that too, yeah. because it's important to know, you know, because a lot of the other groups around that time, the Spinners, they were recording, yeah. Yeah. their background vocals were on those records. Yeah. Um, but but you're right, I mean, if you can maybe tell the audience. Yeah, Tommy, you know. Tommy didn't like the sound mm. of, uh, of the original stylistics. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I guess uh, I didn't either because uh, yeah. that uh, Your Big Girl Now was never my favorite song. And right, that was sure. us doing that. And I think yep. that had an, uh, an impression on Tommy Bell mm -hmm. and the people at the record company because they only asked me to go down to meet him. Sure. So uh, he explained to me that uh, I would be recording the leads on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would use his own people to do the backgrounds. And mm -hmm. they were people from here. They were uh, DJs, a uh, guy named Carl Helm. I still see Carl. Carl was a very good singer. Yeah. Uh, Bunny Siegler. Bunny he was Siegler. Singer. Bunny Siegler was, to me, is the greatest singer in Philadelphia. Interesting. The year before he passed away. Yeah. And um, he wrote a lot of great songs, by the way, for the OJs yeah. and, and many others. Yes. And Kenny Gamble would yeah. also sing on the songs mm. and Phil Hurt. He wrote some of the Spinner songs. Yeah. Phil would sing on them songs also. Yeah. And the Sweeties, mm -hmm. uh, Barbara Ingram, Yvette, and Carla. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, and they gotcha. would sing yeah. on there. And Tommy would utilize, and, and himself, mm -hmm. he would utilize mm -hmm. his, his people and himself and have me sing some of the harmony parts too. Mm -hmm. And that's how them songs came about for at least the first mm. three albums. Yeah, can you kind of take us back to the debut album? Um, you know, I, I just want to go through the short list here of some of the songs that were on this album. Stop Look and Listen to Your Heart, Bet You By Golly Wow, You Are Everything, People Make the World Go Round. I mean, just those songs alone are unbelievable. But to have that be the debut album, um, just if you can, talk a little bit about recording those songs and, and kind of, you know, maybe a couple stories behind maybe a couple of those songs. Um. You really don't know mm. that the songs are going to be hit songs. Sure. And you apply yourself. Mm -hmm. I would sit down and learn the songs, learn how my voice has to work with these songs and do the best job you can. Go in the mm -hmm. studio and you re record. And uh, it would help to have somebody like uh, Joe Tarsia working at the board yeah. and, and helping you do what Great you do. Great engineer, it. by the way. Yeah, in the yeah. studio. Yeah. And, um, it's a work process. Mm -hmm. You don't think about it's going to be a hit. You don't think about if it's going to be played. You think only of performing. Mm -hmm. You think only of doing the song the best that you can. Mm. And you sing it and you sing it. And Tommy Bell would tell you if he likes what you're doing. Because yeah. Tommy, one thing I learned with working with him, that mm -hmm. every little thing in the song mm. is 
well thought out by him. Mm -hmm. So he knows where he wants the song to go. Yeah. He will give you leeway if you do something that that appeals to him. Yeah. But otherwise, you know, you stick to the script. Mm -hmm. And you would sing the song and sing the song and do the best you can, do the best you can. And not really know how well the song is until later. Yeah. Because as as I said, we would record the songs and I would leave to go back on the road. Yeah. So when I would come back into Philadelphia and go down to see him, he would have some uh, some roughs mm -hmm. and he would let you listen to the roughs. And uh, if things didn't sound the way he wanted them to sound or you didn't like it or whatever, you would probably go back in the studio and recut it. And yeah. Do it again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think we ever had to do that. Wow. And uh, next thing, uh, I'd come back off the road again, and next thing I know, they were finished. Mm. Now, I understand there's a story behind You Are Everything where Tom and Linda were at a, at a diner or something, and they saw, maybe you can... Uh, he told me that story, uh, and I've heard it, mm. you know, otherwise said, uh, that him and her went out to lunch, mm -hmm. and they saw somebody... Uh, like a guy going up to a, a, a woman or mm -hmm. something like that and 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 confronting the woman thinking that it was someone else that he knew right and after a while he found out it was not her mm. and uh, that's the basic theme of your everything right yeah yeah Very I saw you know today I saw somebody who looked just like you she walked like you do I thought it was you yeah yeah, yeah. very interesting so you know, uh, and, and you mentioned Betcha by Golly Wow um, is your favorite yes. song from the Stylistics. Um, any memories of recording that or just any memories maybe after that song, hearing it for the first time with your vocals on it? Um, the only thing I remember about that song is it was a different time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I used to smoke years ago. Yeah. And I remember going in the studio, setting up my little ashtray down here and having my little things here and my yeah. water over here yeah. <laughs> and my cigarettes here. And while yeah. I'm not singing, I'm smoking. <laughs> and, yeah. and I remember doing Betcha by Golly Wow. Mm. I can see it in my mind now in the studio and looking through the window and mm -hmm. I can look at Tommy and him and I'm singing, I'm singing. Yeah. And I remember trying to get inside of this song, trying yeah. to get inside of it. Mm -hmm. And I would do that with every song. Yeah. You yeah. know, but uh and then Bet You by Golly Wow became my favorite when I sang it on stage. Yeah. And I noticed, I said, this song right here is not my uh, biggest song. Mm -hmm. You make me feel brand new is the biggest one. Mm. But this song right here is the yeah. one that's capturing everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then everyone else started recording it. Yeah. I started they sure did. And other artists, you know, they doing sure it. They sure did. Yeah. It's not coming up, but it's mm -hmm. a very, very special song. It really is. And yeah. uh, I wasn't the first one. I found out later that I wasn't the first one who sang it. Really? It was called something else, but it was recorded by uh, Connie Francis. No, Inter Connie Stevens. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, and, and I was going to ask you about Betcha by Golly Wow, too. Obviously, you mentioned a lot of people covered it. What were your thoughts when Prince covered it? <laughs> what were your thoughts on his version and um, his take on it? Because obviously, he, I, think, yeah. I think a lot of what he did later on and, and early on, too, was probably inspired by your voice. You it, know? Was, it, was, it was all right. Yeah. I wasn't really crazy about it, but mm. it was all right. Yeah. And I, whenever anyone would sing Betcha by Golly Wow, yeah. I would, you know, I knew... It was more than just me. Right. It, it was a song. But my favorite is, you know, my favorite singer. She did yep. it. <laughs> Dion yep. did it. Yep. And, and when she did it, it, I loved everything about it. You know, mm. the, 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 the different changes, because they were, I could hear that they, was, they were saying, mm. we're going to try to make this a little different than the stylistics. Yep. And, and the little changes that they did in there, I, I really enjoyed them and the harmonies and, of course, her voice. Mm. But my very, very favorite one yeah. is Phyllis Hyman. Mm. Okay. Phyllis Hyman could sing Betcha by Golly Wild. I mean, when I could hear yeah. that same emotion that I feel when I yeah. sing it, when I heard Phyllis do it. Dion did well, a I'm great gonna job. Well, I'm going to tell you my favorite is yours. But, oh, thank you. But, you know. Listen, I, I admire the others, and uh, you know Prince is, uh, he's probably one of my favorite, not, not, I, not he is one of my favorite, he is probably my favorite artist of all time, God rest his soul, but um, 
you know, and, and, I, and again, you know, going back to the falsetto, I think a lot of what he took, you know, was from, you know, people before him, like yourself and others, you know, so um, I don't think there would be a Prince without your influence, you know. So well, maybe on that song. I, I think in I think in general too. I think a lot of these guys were, you know, um, you know, formulating their their voices, you know, to some of the people prior that came before, you know. Yeah, I met a lot of falsettos, great falsettos, mm. you know, in the last fifty years, and uh, he had a he had a very nice tone. He could sing very high. Yeah. Um, I would say closer to possibly somebody like Philip Bailey and Philip. Oh yeah, Philip has a great. Yeah, Philip yeah. has the has everything all around mm -hmm. the, the range, the softness, the whatever. Philip is a great singer. Mm -hmm. um, my falsetto I like is uh, Eddie Kendricks. Eddie Kendricks, because Eddie could go from the natural voice to the falsetto, yeah. and you could really not hear the difference in it mm -hmm. and sell a song like that. Yeah. Smokey has that same ability, also. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Two of my favorites as well. Um, I want to get into round two, 1972, and, and, and I want to mention something to our audience here watching. You know, 1972 was a special year, not only because round two came out and we had some great songs on that record, but also that same year, Backstabbers came out by the OJs, the, the album Backstabbers, and also the Spinners uh, came out with uh, How Could I Let You Get Away and I'll Be Around. The A-side was... Uh, how could I let you get away? Mm -hmm. And the B side was "I'll Be Around." All those came out in '72. Philly was on a roll. They really were, and Tom <laughs> Bell was on a roll. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know, it's interesting if you if you look at it that way. And and I want to, um, if you can, shed some light too later on. Um, you know, working with the Spinners or knowing them, I'd like to hear your thoughts because uh, obviously, um, you know, Felipe Wynn and, and Bobby Smith, you know, were two of the best. You know, yeah, of all time. Uh, you know? I didn't know the Spinners. Okay. And in 1973, mm -hmm. I, I found out that Tommy Bell was not going to be working with us anymore. Right. And I said, oh, my God, what's going to happen? Yeah. What's going on? What's going to happen? Yeah. Uh, 1973 was a very rough year for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I really wasn't getting along well mm -hmm. with the guys in the group. But. We had big hits that year. Yep. You know, uh, You Make Me Feel Brand New was up for a Grammy. Mm -hmm. uh, working, we started traveling all over the world. And yep. Things became, was get, you know, growing even more and more. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to get away. Mm. Things wasn't working right. Yeah. And uh, I worked with Eddie Kendricks and I explained to him what my problem was. Mm -hmm. And Eddie told me, he said, you know how many people you feed? He said, these guys, all these guys here, their families or whatever because mm. of what you're doing. And uh, I ended up staying yep. for another uh, 33 years. But during that time, I worked with some good producers. And, and uh, when Tommy left, we yeah. started to work with Van McCoy. Yep. And Van clicked. Mm -hmm. Not so much here in the United States. But in the rest of the world, London, all right. over England, yeah. all yeah. over South Southeast Asia, right. Japan, yeah. uh, Africa, mm -hmm. everywhere. I mean, it just exploded all over the world mm -hmm. when it was going down here in Philly. Yeah. So the work just got more and more. We started mm -hmm. traveling more and more and more. But to get back to what you said about Philadelphia, yeah. Whenever we were home, we would work with the people who had. Uh, who were having su success at the same time. Yeah. Not so much with the OJs, but Harold Melvin's Blue Nose, because you they worked were from with them here, a lot. I worked with them a whole lot. But at that time, there was a lot of other great uh, recording artists out also. Sure. You know, off the top of my head, I couldn't say right now who mm -hmm. they really were, but it was groups like the Joneses, the, the uh, uh, Three Degrees. Three Degrees. Sure. Uh, the intruders, uh, persuaders, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the persuasions, the yeah. intruders. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked with Wilson Pickett during that time. Uh, yeah. Al Green had came out, and, I, mm, and we were Al working Green. with Al yeah. Green. And it was a lot of music just co coming from all over the country, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, the Philly thing was like, you know, I always said I wanted to work with the OJs and the Whispers. Yeah, you know, because. I knew they were 
a notch above us, mm. hit wise. Hit wise, yeah. And and uh, I got this thing where when I'm I'm highly competitive, mm -hmm. but I I don't put down other artists. I don't say anything bad of about course, others. Yeah. I use them as motivation. Mm -hmm. And I've been an athlete all my life, so when I know that I got to work with some people that are of that caliber, mm. I train like I'm in the service, or I train like uh, like a marine. I, I would have, I had a gym in the house at that time. I would work out, work out and work out because the better my body was, mm -hmm. the better my voice was. Mm. So I would work and work and work and I'm a runner. I still run now, but I don't lift in anything like yeah. that anymore. Yeah. And I would work until I would get in the best shape I could mm. because I always had it in my mind. I'm like a gun and Tommy Bell gives me the bullets. Yeah. So long as I got the right bullets right. and my gun is working, I'm, ready I'm not afraid of anybody yeah. on stage. Yeah. Yeah. But I knew if I worked with the OJs yeah. and I worked with the Whispers mm -hmm. and I worked with the Temptations and I worked with the Four Tops, that I'd be working with the cream of the crop. Mm -hmm. And the better I would get working, you know, working with them. You, and it's still the same. It has not changed. Yeah. You know, I work and with it's the all OJ. Time, yeah. It's all timeless music. Yep. I you worked know, with the OJs last yeah. week. I did the same thing. Yeah. You know, I worked hard, worked very, very hard to do well, but not just for the OJs because I was working home. Yeah. Working home is the hardest jobs, you know, that mm -hmm. for me that I can do. Because you want to give your best. Yes. Yep. Everyone that you grew up with, mm -hmm. everyone that you know is there. Is, everybody is there, yep. you know, to see what you, you know, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you work for a black audience, you either you either do well or you don't do anymore. Mm. You know, so mm -hmm. you really have mm -hmm. to keep your mind on, you know, what's happening. When I was young, I didn't care. You did. Nope. I just go up there and sing, do the best I can. <laughs> and it was probably still pretty damn good. You know? it, it, it was it was easy. I yeah, just went yeah. and did it and whatever. Right. But the older I got, yeah. the, the I guess the more meticulous you mm -hmm. know I became. Even more now. critical. Yeah. 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 And uh, I work every day. I I mm -hmm. built up. Uh, you know, the older you get, the smarter you you, you mm -hmm. become. You know, mm -hmm. I smoked at one time. I stopped smoking. Yeah. I drank at one time. I stopped drinking. And it's amazing to think you were smoking back then during those records because the voice sounds smooth as butter. You know what I mean? So you, we wouldn't get the sense that you're smoking a lot of cigarettes or cigars or whatever. You know, everything works mm -hmm. until it don't anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you can use yeah. a lot of things for crutches. You know, some people. You know, I've never done hard drugs or anything. Mm. You know, but people have a reason to do certain things mm -hmm. and it might be a placebo or it might be a crutch or it might actually help you work mm. better. Some, you know, some people like the jazz artists, you know, I, I listen to a lot of jazz now mm -hmm. the older I became and, and the more I studied, or studied music, yeah. I like jazz more. And I was astounded by how many jazz musicians back mm -hmm. in the day were hooked on heroin. Mm. And it had to have some type of creative aspect with them to put your body and your mind through something like that mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. it must be you know because i haven't done it i think to myself it must be very pleasurable right. <laughs> you know right. it, it had to give you something mm -hmm. to want to do that sure you know mm -hmm. but like i said before everything works until it doesn't until it doesn't right right and I, I want to go back to round two because uh, I think you'll get a kick out of this. Um, my father, one of his favorite songs, actually, matter of fact, we, we were sitting down a couple weeks back and, and he told me that I'm Stone in Love With You is in his top 20 <laughs> favorite songs of all time. And I think for me, it probably sits in that top 20 as well. And um, just I, I know there's a story behind this. Um, I think you were shooting pool, right? Yes, yes. Can you take me back to that night? when you know you were shooting pool and eventually you know you go record that song um i remember when we first started to work on stone in love with you and uh, i had met him mm. because he was the musical director for the delphonics mm -hmm. and that was tommy's brother tony bell tony bell and is he still alive by no way? he's not he's not okay and tony wrote stone in love with you gotcha so uh you know what he i think I, he came up in the office while we were working on that mm -hmm. and that's how i found out that he was the writer of it yeah but at that time i was you know i was in the street i was you know shooting a lot of pool mm -hmm. gambling and doing things <laughs> like that <laughs> and i had to be down at the 
I think that was Regent Studio. It used mm -hmm. to be Cameo. It wasn't Parkway. Sigma Sound. No, no, it was the one next to 309 Broad. Gotcha. And uh, that afternoon, I'm shooting pool. I'm all yeah. morning long. And I was winning. Yeah. And I kept looking at my watch. Kept looking at my watch. I said, oh, I got to go down here to the studio. <laughs> and I'm winning. And the pool room is at a street called Sydenham mm -hmm. and Columbia. Now, Sydenham is this street. The next street is 15th and the next street is Broad. Broad Street is the where the subway line is, mm. and it takes you right down downtown. Mm -hmm. And I could get off right there and go right to the studio. Yeah. So I'm pushing it to the last minute, pushing yeah. it to the last minute. And uh, I get on the subway, I go down, and Tommy, you know, Tommy was a, a, a <laughs> he, he don't mince his words, you mm. know. And I came in the studio. I had been hanging out all day. Mm. I had been in the bar. I had yeah. been playing pool. I come in the studio and he look at me and I remember him saying, you've been in that saloon again, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And went in there yeah. and cut Stone in Love with You. Yeah. And Stone in Love with You, to me, when I listen to it, mm -hmm. is one of the best songs I've ever sang. Oh, it's... And it's a perfect song. And it's a perfect song. When I'm listening to it, yeah. I think to myself that it's one of the best songs I ever sang oh, until I get to the end. What don't you like about that? I end? can't tell you that. You can't tell me. I can't tell nobody okay. that. If you don't hear it, yeah. it ain't there. Okay. But I hear it. I don't it. think there's anything wrong with it. Every but. time I hear this song, I can hear this, this, one, this one problem, thing. this one yeah. thing at the end of the song. <laughs> And, uh, Interesting. And we cut it fast. I think we went in there and bang. Was that, that a one was take, it? one take shot? Something like that. And bang, and I was back on the subway down, going back Jeez. to the pool room. Well, we thank you for for showing up that night because that is by far it one of the greatest the songs of all time. It was yeah. in the afternoon. We always recorded. Yeah. In the evening, we yeah. would go to Sigma Sound and record mm. in the evening, and that one was in the afternoon. Mm. Yeah. Well, that that was an afternoon that we'll. Well, thank you for for forever. You know, I, I, that, you know and, and Stone in Love with You. When I sing yeah. it on stage, I think yeah. about that sometimes. You know, yeah. I just I just uh, recorded mm -hmm. a song that reminds me of Stone in Love mm. with You. And when I and when I sing that song, yeah, I think of, I should be singing <laughs> thinking of that song, but yeah. I think about Stone in Love. By with the you. way, when you showed up to the studio, was that song already done? Were the musicians done with it at that point? Well, we are. I always sing vocals to the rhythm tracks. To the rhythm track. Yeah, so he had already put so the So that rhythm, was already done. Yeah, the rhythm's down. Gotcha. Who, who played on that, though? Was that MFSB? or? Yeah, it was. they played on all of them, but it was okay. like different members of M Got it. MFSB. MFSB, I know, it's a yeah, tongue twister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great was, musicians, yeah, by the way. I mean, One drummer would play on one thing, one guitar player would yeah. play on another, mm -hmm. you know. And did, did Tony Bell, did Tom's brother, did he play on that any? That I, I don't know. You don't know? No. Interesting. Know. But w what was he like? Was he a interesting character yeah he was a very nice guy extremely yeah. nice i remember yeah. him being extremely nice to me mm -hmm. and uh he worked with one of the tenors that and tommy did too mm -hmm. to me is the greatest falsetto that ever came out of philadelphia i know uh ron tyson is very great very yeah. very great sing with the temptations i grew mm -hmm. up listening to him and singing his songs yeah eddie holman Eddie Holman is one of my greatest inspirations. Blue when, Magic. Blue Magic. When I was when I was young. Yeah. Ted Mills. I met Ted, Ted Mills, Mills before he even was with Blue Magic, and mm -hmm. he had a he has a very great voice. He sure does. But William Hart of the Delphonics mm. has one of the most when he was young. Yeah. Captivating voices I have ever heard, and not only just his voice, mm -hmm. his command. His command yeah when when I would tour with him when I was young mm -hmm. uh, I had a shy demeanor I, I, I think I still do you mm -hmm. know so when I'm on stage I don't come across very authoritative you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I used to come off stage and go out and sit in the audience and watch him mm -hmm. and his voice and his demeanor would demand your it, attention yes Mm. I mean, and I always admired that about him, you know, and and we did an album together, me, him, the and three Ted, tenors. Yeah, yeah, me, him and Ted right. Mills. Yeah. And I got a chance to know each other. Yeah. And, oh, that was so funny. That was yeah. a funny thing. But yeah, to me, William. Mm. Interesting. William. Yeah. 
What, what, from round two, does anything else stand out in your mind in terms of uh, any of the recordings? Um, you know, break up to make up, uh, you know, uh, maybe the, the um, you'll never get to heaven, which Dion did. Any of those stand out in terms of, you know, taking you back to when you recorded those or? Nothing, nothing special mm. on the first two albums. Mm -hmm. uh, the songs were special. The songs? Yeah, the, the songs, songs were special. Very but, special because yeah. the, the country went crazy oh, over the songs. And they still, and they still are. And yep. then the last album, the Rock and Roll Baby. Rock and Roll Baby, yep, yep. Yeah. I remember I wasn't in the greatest shape. Mm. on a Rock and Roll Baby album. I had been working so much. I was mm -hmm. on the road working and working and working. Yeah. And that falsetto, the falsetto has a mind of its own. Mm. And when you're tired or you, you haven't, you know, you've been working too much, the falsetto wants to shut down. Mm -hmm. But Tommy Bell did something for me that is, that has allowed me to still be able to sing right now. Mm is when I first came in his office, mm -hmm. he said to me, the first thing we're gonna do is bring that key down. Mm. Because I sang everything tremendously high, mm -hmm. you know, before that. I'm singing Delphonic songs, I'm singing uh, uh, Ron Tyson songs, mm -hmm. I'm singing uh, Eddie Holman songs, you know, and all of them had these tremendously high falsettos. Mm -hmm. But he said, first thing I'm gonna do for you is I'm gonna bring it down. And yeah. he brought the key down, I didn't like it. Yeah. But, you know, like I said, I was learning. Mm -hmm. He brought the key down. So yeah. all of them songs we sang in a certain key mm -hmm. in my falsetto plus natural. But n I learned over the years that my natural voice has been saving my life. Mm. When the falsetto gets tired and I can't use it as much. The natural kicks the in. The natural will kick in. Mm. So that's one of the reasons why I still can sing right now. It's and, like a fine tuned automobile, and, and, you know. And, and sing in, in the same key. Interesting. So yeah. I can do that. But um, uh, I lost my, t uh, my train of thought. That was leading up to the question that you had asked me. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, we were talking, we were getting ready to talk about Rock and Roll Baby. Rock and Roll Baby. I wasn't in too great of a shape for mm -hmm. that album. And the key, the key was the same, but I used more of my natural voice on mm -hmm. that album. Yeah. And uh, I... I I learned a lot from doing that, mm -hmm. and it was the last. It was the last thing I did with Tommy, and uh, it's a song on there that we do in the show now that reminds me of that time. Mm -hmm. uh, could this be the end? Okay, and yep. uh, it was mm, interesting. Mm -hmm. What What were your initial thoughts when you heard "Rock and Roll Baby" for the first time? Because it was really the first up tempo. That's what my right. first thoughts was. All of a sudden, I say, "Oh man, we got finally, <laughs> finally, we got an up tempo song." Yeah, and yeah. we really make it up tempo because we do oh, it yeah. faster than what Tommy gave it to us. Yeah, because people, when you sit, when you go on stage and you sing for an hour, mm -hmm. and every song sounds at the same tempo, same tempo and yeah. the same feeling, mm -hmm. and at a certain time, we became the stars of the show. Sure. Yeah. So people have sat through three or four acts before you get on stage. Mm -hmm. And by the time you get on stage and you, when you first get on, they're crazy. They love what you're doing. Yeah. About three or four songs down, they start. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you needed Rock and Roll Baby to we, get them, pick them back up. We yeah. needed Rock yeah. and Roll, and we still yeah. do. Yeah. Rock and Roll Baby is the picker-upper of our I love show. It. I yeah. love it. Yeah. <laughs> And, it, and it's a great song and um, yeah. you know and, and Tom around that time was doing a lot of other great up-tempo songs for the spinners you know yeah, we were talking about I, I that I think before. Tommy wrote that uh, they wrote uh, Rock and Roll Baby about one of yeah. his sons right right I heard, I heard, I've heard yeah. that um, were there any songs that the spin that he did for the spinners that you wish he had kept for the stylistic all of them <laughs> all of them yeah all yeah. of them yeah in fact i'm in the process of recording some of them oh, now oh great yeah uh, great. on the three tenors album i did yeah. one of them how could you let, uh, let me get that. away i love that song. Uh, such a great song i just did i just did uh, i don't want to lose you mm. and it's on my new on my new album oh great great and so i i try i have control now yeah. I can sing whatever I want to sing. Mm -hmm. So whenever uh, me and my partner get together, he likes uh, Bell's music also. Yeah. So we switch. He if he wants me to sing something yeah. that he likes, mm -hmm. I sing what he likes. If I want him want to sing something that mm. that I like, I sing it. Yeah. So I always try to put a Bell song on on my on my album, 
and a back, and Burt Backrack song. So yeah. that way I can sing yeah. whatever I want, you know. Yeah. I just wanted to mention too, your your right as rain is also another gem from round two. Yes, it's it's uh, one of them sleepers or sneaky songs. Yeah, uh, great album cut. Yeah, it's uh, yours. Right as rain has mm -hmm. almost that same type of feel as uh, could this be the end? Mm. Uh, the first person I heard do yours right as rain was Nancy Wilson. Oh, interesting. And uh, she did a, a beautiful job because mm. I'm I'm a big Nancy Wilson fan. Sure. Also, when sure. I was a teenager, mm -hmm. one of my favorite albums was Nancy Wilson and, and Cannibal Adley. Mm. The album she did with him. Um, Rock and Roll Baby. On that album, yeah, there was another song. Uh, oh, and I'm sorry, did I? I I, I, uh, I don't know if I said Round Two for years, right? Yeah. I meant to say Rock and Roll Baby. Right. Yeah. That's right. Seventy three. Yeah. But um, long time ago. But uh, but again, timeless music. You know, all this stuff is, is still listened to and appreciated and loved today. You know. Yeah, and and I I, I listen to uh, a lot of the the Spinners music, not just because Bell did it and mm. they're great songs. Yeah. I love Felipe Wayne. Oh, he was unbelievable. I never heard nobody ad lib. Wasn't he great? Do the things that Felipe Wayne could do. And, you no, know, neither I went I. to see him also when he left the Spinners. You yeah. Know, I went to Atlantic City, see him at Club yeah. Harlem, and he was great. I mean, yeah. uh, he was, he was old, he was older than, than, you know, than, than myself. Mm -hmm. And he had that jazz influence in his music. You could tell in yeah. his voice. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I really enjoyed him. I like Bobby also. I like, uh, yeah. uh, 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 Bobby is the one that sang most of the leads, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, he did all be around. Yeah. 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 I liked him little off key once in a while. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I think that was a signature for him, like mm -hmm. the little Sonny of, the, of uh, the Intruders. Gotcha. He sang a little off key, but it was his. His style. His, his style. Yeah. And you learned to, to like it. Right. Um, but yeah, Felipe was just I like Henry, Henry's yeah. voice. Henry sang them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you may not matter, but then on a hill. Ba, 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 da, ba, da, ba, mm. He sang them. He mm. was the soft one in, in the group. I like his, his voice, yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So take us to Bell. He gets out of the picture at this point, And then Hugo and Luigi step in, right? And was that 74? Were they coming yes, to the picture? Yes. If it wasn't for Van McCoy, I'd have shot myself. Mm. <laughs> well, yes. we're glad they came into the picture then. But um, Hugo, Luigi, Hugo Luigi. Yeah. That's when I first start having riffs. Yeah. You know, with people in the in mm -hmm. the uh, in the record business, record yeah. companies. Yeah. What were they like? What uh, was their, they were nice guys. They were yeah. very nice guys, but yeah. they were a little old fashioned for me. Yeah. At the time. And the songs were a little cheesy, cheesy and yeah. a little too popish for me. Yeah. And I had to say, you know, sometimes I'm not going to sing that. Yeah. I don't care what you say. I'm not going to sing that, you yeah. know, because some of them songs was just out of here. Mm. My wife was messing with me last night. Yeah. Because uh, we went to see The Lion King. Yeah. And they do uh, The Lion Sleeps Tonight in there. Yeah. I recorded that for them. Oh, sure. yeah. that album. I can't I can't play it. You can't play I it. I can't even play that album. Yeah. I believe the album that we have here has still got the plastic on it. Yeah. I, I, wow. I just, you know, and they would yeah. come up with some songs that would be good in a Broadway play or sure. something else. But not for an R&B singer. Yeah. Too theatrical. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. And, and like you said, cheesy. Yeah. And it was a rough town, but Van would always have one song in there. Mm -hmm. He would yeah. always put one there. Uh, in fact, I, on my new album, I yeah. re-recorded one of Van's songs that I did with them, uh, yeah. Keeping My Fingers Crossed. And um, Van gave us a big record for England and Japan, uh, Can't Give You Anything But Love. Mm. And that was like the, 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 the pre-song of when he did The Hustle. Yeah, gotcha. Um, I want you to take me to 1980 because at this point we get... Um, probably one of the greatest stylistic songs that came after the 70s um, and and I'm talking about Hurry Up This Way Again which is one of my favorites and, and a great vocal performance by yourself um, wondering what was that like um, recording with Gamble and Huff and also Dexter Wanzell was the main composer behind that 
that song, right? Yeah. So can you kind of take me back to that point and, and what, what that was like recording that one? Well, I have to go back a little bit further please. than that. Yeah, please. When we left Hugo and Luigi, yeah. we worked with someone I really enjoyed working with. Mm -hmm. I worked with Teddy Rendazzo. Mm -hmm. And the songs that we did with Teddy Rendazzo might be the best songs that the stylistics as a whole mm. did. You know, it got to a point where I went to bat for the guys. Because yeah. Hugo and Luigi and them didn't want to use them either. Interesting. And they they had ideas of me going off and singing by myself. And doing solo, Doing yeah. all that stuff. So I, yeah. I had made up my mind after mm -hmm. talking to Eddie Kendrick that mm -hmm. I would stay with the group. Yeah. And I would tell them, I said, look, we have to start using these guys on some of these songs mm -hmm. because we're going on the road and people are coming up to me saying, Y'all don't sound like that. Right. Y'all don't sound like the record. Mm -hmm. This don't sound like this. This don't. So my idea was if they're on there, we'll sound like that. Right. Later on, I found out that might have been <laughs> not a good yeah, right. choice, <laughs> you know, but it was yeah, great yeah. for, you know, for the act for the, at the time. For the time being, yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, but when we did the album for Teddy Mendazzo, mm. I think everybody performed because everyone sang mm -hmm. on that album. And I think yeah. almost everyone performed to the best that we had ever done. Mm-hmm. And uh, we did two albums with him, and then we moved on. And yeah. that's when Kenny Gamble then picked us up yeah. to come do Hurry Up This Way again. So how did that all come about? How did, can you take me back to that? Business decisions between yeah. uh, management and, and yeah. Gamble and them. You know, yeah. another thing, you know, they, yeah. would, they would say, all right, <laughs> be down so-and-so at 3.30 yeah. on Monday yeah. <laughs> again. Yeah. And I come down and they give me the songs. And did you show up for that one and that one was already done or was that being worked on while you were there? Uh, we, that was a process that was totally different than I've worked with anybody okay. else in the world. And I think you, when you uh, interviewed the OJs, they said something about it. Yeah. Gamble and them worked uh, with a different system yeah. than I had ever done. When you go in 309, yeah. Their offices were in a loop. Mm -hmm. You start on the first day in the first office. Yeah. Some of the junior writers were in there. Mm -hmm. And you sit down with the junior writers and they will show you the songs that they had. Mm -hmm. And they had little recorders in there and you would learn the songs that day sitting with, with just the piano. Because I heard Walter you know, tell, mm -hmm. tell you that about how you sit down with just right. the piano player. Yep. And the piano player would play the songs and you learn it and you sing it and mm -hmm. you record it on, on a cassette. Uh, the next day you move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. The next day you move on to the next writer. Yeah. And you work on about 20 songs until you, we would say we were over here in Mudville. Yeah. And we go into the high rent dis district. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy, around, you turn the corner, Tommy sure. Bell and them offices were around there. Yeah. So when yeah. you got around the other side, McFadden Whitehead, yeah. Tommy Bell's office, Bunny Leon Sigler, Bunny right? Sigler, yeah. Leon Huff yeah. and them offices yeah. was around there. Yeah. So you work your way around and by the mm. time you get to the end, it, we never got a chance to work mm -hmm. with McFadden and Whitehead. Yeah. I, would, you, I knew them. They were great, weren't they? Previously from yeah. their first singing groups before okay. they were writers. I knew them years before. Yeah. And uh, every time I would see them, they would say, yeah. I got a song for you. We're going to do this song. I never got a chance to, to do one of their songs, mm -hmm. but the people that work with them, I, I, uh, I did one of their songs, the Ingrams. Yeah. Barbara Ingram Brothers mm -hmm. wrote a song uh, called Found a Love You Couldn't Handle. Okay. And we yep. ended up recording that. And yep. that's another in, uh, up tempo song that yep. we use in the show. Yeah. But uh, the process. And then Kenny Gamble and Dexter would listen to everything that we had done on the cassettes. Mm -hmm. And Kenny would listen to them and say, all right, this sounds like a song that you could do. This sounds like a song you could do. This sounds like a song you could do. Mm -hmm. And they would start to put the rhythms down mm -hmm. before it was time to go in the studio. I think mm -hmm. it keys, like the keys of the song from us. But, at, but then at the same time, mm -hmm. I'm working with some of their A&R people on some of their other people who have boxes of songs on cassettes. And sure. you're sitting there listening to them, putting them yeah. in there every day, every day to see if it's something that you like. Mm -hmm. And so that's the process they, they had done. Yeah. And... Um, after they put the rhythms down, you go in the studio and uh, you record everything. And at the end of it, you see which is the best one and the one that everyone likes. And yeah. of course, uh, the top, top dogs, you know, 
they have the last say on everything you yeah. know that's going down mm -hmm. and uh, usually by that time all the songs are so so good mm -hmm. that everyone likes them you you hate to see one not make it right but whatever did you know was going down herb this way again was that 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 way mm -hmm. it worked very well Sure. Did. And working with Dexter, I got a chance to know Dexter. I saw him last week. Mm. I got a chance to work with Dexter and Dexter was like a hands on type of guy. I would sit behind the board with him and watch yeah. what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And I learned from, you know, working with him also, mm. And, mm. Uh, you know, and we would hang out together. We would go out after the, yeah. the sessions and go to clubs and mm -hmm. he played the organ. And I'd sing it at, nice. at different clubs and nice. stuff. So I got a chance to know Dexter very well. Mm. And that song, going back to that one, that was something that, uh, like you said, was kind of probably already done by the time you got there, right? Uh, the the yeah, gotcha. Yeah, um, Dexter has a a, a mis mystery in his music mm. that I liked, and uh, Harry this Harry this way again. Yeah, it was some, some nice changes. Yes, yeah. It, uh, is that him playing the synth, by the way, in that break? Probably. He yeah. plays all, all That's a the, great, like, great part. Almost yeah. everything. It was the first time I'd ever worked with a drum machine. I didn't like drum machines. I thought machines. it was nice, though, on that song. You know, uh, had, I had... don't think Harry Up This Way Again is a drum machine. Oh, that's not a drum no. machine. Okay. I think he... It, I don't think so. Yeah. No, Steve Rudd, I think, played Whatever drums it is, it, yeah. whether it's real or drum machine, it's a great yeah. sound. It he sounds great. He used yeah. a drum machine on Always Something There to Remind Me. Okay. The... Uh, the Dan Warwick song. Sure. Yeah. And uh, I, I said, Dex, I don't like drums. He said, don't worry about it. I got a drum machine that you're going to yeah. love. And he said, I think at the time he mm -hmm. said he had got it from uh, Prince. Oh, interesting. The yeah. Lynn, probably the Lynn, uh, the uh -huh. Lynn drum machine. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it turned out to be, very, I, I play it now because, uh, mm. you know, Dexter had a, found a real nice groove. Yeah. Real nice groove. Mm hmm. By the way, you mentioned McFadden and Whitehead before. Um, they're obviously no longer with us, unfortunately. But what were they like as as individuals? And you know, uh, they were nice guys. Yeah. Um, when I first met them, they were in a group called the Epsilons, mm. and uh, we worked together. And uh, they had some trouble with, I think, the Internal Revenue. Oh, okay. And gotcha. one of them ended up doing some time. Oh, okay. Uh, and it was a bar not too far from here I was hanging out at. Yeah. And when uh, when Gene, I think it was Gene that that would, did some time when he got out, mm. limousine pulled up to the to the bar. I looked yeah. at the door. I said limousine. He came in. He was talking to me. Mm -hmm. He said, Russ, I'm getting ready to start this company. I'm getting ready to do this. I'm getting ready to do that. Yeah. And uh, he wanted me to come and do some recording with him. Yeah. And that was one of the last time I had ever talked with him. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, McFadden and Whitehead, for our listeners watching and our viewers watching, you know, two, two songs that come to mind that stand out as maybe being two of their best are Backstabbers by the OJs and also um, Wake Up Everybody by yep. uh, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. And which is Ain't a, No Stopping Us Now. And Ain't No Stopping Us Now. Yep. They had, they had many, many great songs. I, uh, yeah. I had the privilege of, of uh, the guys in it. MSFB. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To, uh, the, the the remainder of the ones yeah. that are still around. Yep. They got put into the uh the Musicians Hall of Fame mm. in Nashville. As they should be. And I went down yeah. and I sang for them. Oh nice. And I got a chance to to do uh Ain't No Stopping Us Now. Yeah. With uh I got a picture of them over the way. Nice. Ricky Skaggs. Nice. Kenny G. Yeah. Garth Brooks. Wow. And a couple nice. of other players. Uh, uh, they're yeah. all over there on that picture. The Garth's band. Nice. And How was that? It was fantastic. Yeah. They are some of the greatest musicians I have ever heard in my life. Mm. The guitar players that were down there with the, uh, with the country guys, mm -hmm. them guitar players are the plainest mm. guys. And Ricky Skaggs played this mandolin. So we're yeah. all standing in, in a yeah. line. Doing ain't no stopping us now. So me and this and, and this lady, I forget yeah. her name, we were singing the song, mm -hmm. and it was an R and B song. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, Ricky Skaggs come in with the mandolin. Yeah. And playing nice, nice. riffs on it, and he's smoking it. I'm mm -hmm. looking. I said, Wow. Kenny G comes in. He yeah. start playing his thing on it, and it was like, mm. Wow. Garth yeah. Brooks do his thing. Yeah. And. Uh, the, this guy that, yeah. that wrote Hotel California. 
Was it Don Felder? Yeah. Was he, he there? I think, yeah, that's him. He, Fingers Felder. They call him he Fingers Felder. He played yeah. a guitar solo Oh, he, on play, that. he can play. The song was rocking. He's I mean, a bad boy. Yeah, he's a bad boy. Yeah. And uh, I've never got a chance to hear it again. I, and, yeah. I, I, and they said it was going to be a PBS special, but I never. But we really turned that Ain't No Stop. Oh, that sounds great. Out. That sounds great. So, you know, I want you to kind of just, if you can, you know, bring bring the story of the stylistics to a close when you finally left the original stylistics in in uh, in 99 and then formed your new stylistics. Can you kind of just take us through that briefly without, you know? That was um, a very rough part of my life. Mm. Uh, going through the late 90s. Yep. Uh, a lot of things I was doing wasn't working anymore. Like yeah. I said, when it works, it works, and when it don't, it don't. Right. A lot yeah. of things wasn't working anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a, I had some financial problems, and yeah. some other things in life, you know, that was uh, really tearing me down. Yeah. And it it tore me down to the point where my voice wasn't acting right. Mm. I wasn't doing good shows, and I wasn't gonna go up in front of people and mm. not do the best I could, you sure. know, so mm -hmm. I quit. I mean, I just right on stage, thank y'all very much, you know, wow. for all this time I've had. I've had a, I had been in the business for 30 some years, you mm -hmm. know, so I'm like, this was wonderful, I'm going home. Yeah. You know, I, you know, my wife, all, she had told me for a long time, she had seen what the problems were. She said, you should have left 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, and yeah. everybody, all my friends and everybody I knew said you should have left 20 something years ago. Yeah. But me, I stayed. I stayed and I worked and I worked. And I didn't know what stress would do to you. Mm -hmm. And it took my voice. Wow. But not like I thought it would. Mm -hmm. I had got to the point where my nervous system and my mind had, was going insane mm -hmm. to where I was praying. Please, Lord, help me. Help me get out of this situation. Help me mm -hmm. get out. And I didn't know how the Lord was going to do it, but uh, he said, all right, I'll help you. Cut. No voice. <laughs> That's a lie. I can't sing. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I would come home from the gig. Yeah. And get some rest. Three days later, my voice would heal enough to where I could go back on the road and mm -hmm. go out and sing. But as soon as I got out there, it was gone. Wow. You know, and it got worse and worse and mm -hmm. worse. The situations got worse. And then, like I said, I quit. That next day after I quit, it was like a miracle. Mm -hmm. I felt like a giant weight had been lifted off of me. Yeah. And I didn't care if I ever sang professionally again wow. or not. You, you know? just felt a lot better. Yeah. And I came home. Mm -hmm. I wasn't worried about singing anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, a guy who had recorded yeah. us in 96 mm -hmm. uh, named Chris Beeler, he's my partner now yeah. with uh, Forevermore Music. Mm -hmm. He said, Russ, I want you to sing a song for me. Yeah. I said, Chris, I'm not in the business no more. I'm not singing anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came and uh, he kept on and kept on calling me, kept yeah. on calling me. He was, I mean, he's a very persistent guy. Sure. And uh, Good music man, mm -hmm. and uh, he was, he had a, a guy to put down the tracks for me. He bought me uh, equipment to record record the songs yeah. and, right down here, mm -hmm. and uh, I did one song. That's all he wanted, and it ended up being seventeen songs. Mm. And I still wasn't ready to get back into business again because, like I said, I had never. I was living in my home. Yeah. I mean, for 30 something years, I wasn't even home mm -hmm. at all. You're on so, the road. Yeah. So now I'm living in my home. I'm here all the time. I'm enjoying myself. Yeah. No pressure in my life or whatever. Then it's going to start again. Yeah. I start. Well, when I left the original stylistic group, they got rid of the band that was working with us. Mm -hmm. And I would see them guys, you know, and they would say, Russ, man, come on, let's start another band. Yeah. Let's, let's do this. I would see Raymond Johnson. Mm -hmm. Raymond Johnson, one of the singers in the, in the uh, new stylistics. Yeah. Raymond was also one of the stylistics. Right. At a time also. Yep. Yep. And uh, he had a, sing a guy, Jonathan Buxton, who was also singing with me now. Mm -hmm. 
they had a group called Portrait in Black. And uh, we were man management for them for a while. So he came mm -hmm. and uh, a friend of mine, James Ranton, that did choreography for the original stylistics, he came. Mm. Still didn't want to sing, but everybody was pestering me. Uh, Chris, uh, Christopher Beeler had the idea of taking, of, of putting out a solo album on mm -hmm. me because of the songs I had cut. Yeah. And uh, that started it all. And I just yep. said, all right, fellas, all right, let's do this. Yep. And we start going all over the city, all over Philly, finding musicians, finding mm -hmm. people who, were, you know, who wanted to play with us. Yeah. And uh, rehearsing. Mm -hmm. I said, well, if we're going to do it, this time we're going to do it right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a, a musical director. He, he, he was with the old band, uh, uh, Kenneth Thompson. I grew up with his brothers. They yeah. were the Thompson brothers, a local group here. Mm -hmm. And he played with them. And he, he came with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just, just lost our guitar player for 30-something years, Michael Abdullah Beatty. Mm. He came with me. And we would go all over the city and watch yeah. other musicians play. And we would bring them in. Mm -hmm. And we started down here. And we would play and rehearse. Come on, we're going to get this just like the record. It ain't going to be. And nobody's going to come out and say, look, y'all don't sound like the record. We don't. Not this time. Mm. We're going to get this. And yeah. we still have the same habits now of rehearsing, going back, listening to the music. Because music has, has, has a way of, when you're doing it for a long time, of evolving. Mm -hmm. Musicians want to play it their way. Yeah. Singers start to sing it their way. We wanted to take everything back. Mm -hmm. Listen to the original stuff. Make it like the record. Perfect so, it. So when people, when they're getting dressed before they come to the show mm -hmm. and they're playing the records, exactly. like you just said, you was listening to the car in the yeah. car. And we, we were. come up there and you see us on yeah. stage, that's what I want you to hear. Yeah. And we've done that now. And we've yeah. been together now for what, 17 years, mm -hmm. the new group. So I want our audience to know, too, if, they, if they're going to see you live, it's the new stylistics featuring Russell Tompkins Jr. No, it's, no, it's not. Nope, it's Russell Tompkins Jr. and the new stylistics. Got it. So make yeah. sure Russell Tompkins Jr. and the new stylistics mm -hmm. if you're going to see him live. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because we want to make sure that everyone knows, you know, where to see you. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's come up to this present day. Mm -hmm. You know, we're still we we perfected what we've done now. Yeah. We. You know, all the years, this is my 50th year in the music business. God bless and congratulations. Thank you. You're welcome. And we've learned how to, uh, how to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, over in 50 years time, I have people with me that's been with me now for over 30 years. Mm. And we know how to do it. Yeah. And good or bad, when we go do a show, we can, you know, the effort that's what's very important. You give it your best. The effort. Yeah. And we, and we try to do the best we can. Mm -hmm. So for our audience watching, is there anything new coming out, the upcoming projects that maybe you want to tell the audience about that maybe you're working on? Uh, I just put out a, 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 brand, a brand new solo album uh, called Between Love Songs mm -hmm. on Forevermore Records. And... Uh, I've cut enough songs and getting and cutting more songs to put out my third solo album. Mm -hmm. But the new stylistics are going to reproduce the Carpenters. Oh, I love you know it's funny you mentioned the Carpenters mm -hmm. because before I started and prior to leading up to the last couple of weeks listening again uh, all the stylistics, right before that I was listening to a lot of Carpenters mm -hmm. I and I was listening to Karen Carpenter and I was thinking to myself. Man, this is, and not only her voice, but the arrangements in those songs. Mm -hmm. And um, just thinking, this is some of the best music of all time. I've sang all of them songs when they first came out. Mm. And I loved that music and loved that music. And I worked with their producer once on a, oh, yeah. a, a so project yeah. I did in Warner Brothers. And I, I, and I also want to hear, we forgot to talk about Burt Bacharach. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so can you tell us that story, working with Burt and, well, and what he was like? Well, Burt is like working with royalty. You mm. know, because uh, he's, he is he's a perfectionist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the songs are so great. Uh, I've talked to him on the phone and he said, all right, we're going to pick these. We, mm -hmm. I got three songs I want you to listen to. Yeah. See which ones you want to sing. Mm -hmm. So 
I picked the one that I wanted. He said, no, you can't do that one. <laughs> he said, Dion is going to do it. That's funny. So yeah. Dion ended up putting the song out, yeah. and I picked two other songs that mm -hmm. we went in the studio to do. Yeah. And Bert was, his, his job was already done. He had mm -hmm. done the music. He had, all you had to do was come in and interpret the song like Tommy Bell. Mm -hmm. Interpret the song, do what he tell you to do, and yeah. throw a, a little of yourself in there as much mm -hmm. as you can. Yeah. But when you get lost, you know, you have to confer, you know, mm -hmm. you have to talk and see how we're going to do this. Yeah. But the songs were Carol Bayer Sager, Sager songs. Yeah. I never work with, uh, to be honest, I mm -hmm. have a little trouble working with uh, women. Mm. She was the first one I had worked in the studio with. And when I got stuck, mm -hmm. she came over and her ideas that she gave me was like, wow. Mm. I never thought about going in that direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I sang it, it was right. Mm. You know, and she did it more than once. Try this right here. Try this mm. right here. Do this right here. And it fit. The it two was just songs. organic. Yes, the organic. two songs yeah. I did mm. with Bert was really fantastic, along mm. with meeting him. Mm. You know, because uh, I was at Amherst Records then. And, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Lenny Silver is the president of Amherst and was a very close friend of Bert's. Mm -hmm. And I've had a chance to be around him, you know, go to his shows in New York and talk to him on the phone and things like that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking at his picture right now, you know, right, sure. wonderful, that wonderful show he did there yeah. in New York. But yeah. he's like, like I said, he's what royalty. a great talent, huh? He's royalty. He really is. Mm -hmm. And so is Dion for that matter. Yes, all of them. They're, they're the greatest of all time. Yeah. I mean. I always look at myself like this. Mm -hmm. I'm good. You're being modest. No, you're great. I'm, I'm good. To, to us, you're great. So but. when I go on stage, mm -hmm. all I have to be is good. Mm. But when you're great, yeah. you can't go on stage and be good. <laughs> That's true. But for everyone watching, we all know you're great. There's no, there's no debate on that. So you feel how you want to feel, okay. but we, we all know the truth. So, you know. Um, but you know, listen, um, yeah. And, and, and again, uh, I'm just trying to think there was one other thing we were talking about. You were talking about Bert and then there was one other thing you were mentioning before you were talking about someone else. Oh, the and carpenters, the carpenters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to get back to them briefly because, you know, while I was listening to these songs and, and kind of examining them while listening, uh, you know, from kind of a musicianship standpoint, um, you know, Richard Carpenter, you know, again, not only a brilliant arranger, but a great player. And if you uh, and, and of course, Karen, you know, what a mm -hmm. voice, you know, but um, yeah, no, I mean, uh, I'm on the same page in terms of, you know, everyone would music, come yeah. to me, even the guys in the group. Mm -hmm. And uh, for years, yeah. you know, you should do the Carpenters, you know, and I never, you know, to me, that's oh, I, that's I'm something that to is that, yeah. hard to to certain things you don't touch. Yeah, that's you know? true. That's true. Yeah. And uh, I started singing the songs and I started thinking to myself, I can do this, mm -hmm. you know? And I went in, I recorded one already, mm -hmm. uh, Rainy Days and Mondays. Great song. And the guys in the group, this is going to be a new stylistic project, not a Russell Tompkins project. Okay. And the guys in the group can do the harmonies. I mean, uh, the, the uh, Kenneth Thompson, Jonathan Buxton, and mm -hmm. Raymond Johnson can sing anything. By the way, when you sing that song, do you sing it in the falsetto both. or do you? Both. Both. Interesting. Yeah. Her range is low. Her range is very low. Yeah. So yeah. I can use both voices. Mm. What What is the key that she sings in in that song? I'm not sure, but it's, yeah. I think it's around B flat. And, mm. and and that's basically the same key that I sing it. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. B, B flat, maybe C. Yeah. yeah. Well, as we wrap up here, you know, not only do I want to thank you on behalf of our viewers, on behalf of the world that has listened and loved and appreciated all this music, I want to thank you personally from the bottom of my heart for being a part of the soundtrack to my life, uh, not only growing up, but, you know, as we continue to uh, enjoy this thing that, that is called life. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your time uh, on the show here today at your home. And um, it, it's been a real honor and a pleasure. Well, thank you so much for letting me be a part of it. Thank you very much, Russell. It's been a pleasure.